Our next webinar entitled Resources for Online Assessment will be developed by Master Cindy Jimenez Pical. Cindy is a researcher in the Technological Research and Innovation Laboratory, LILT UNED. She's a master and has also worked as an English teacher for more than 10 years at the Centro de Idiomas and as a, a thesis director for the English teaching students. Master Jimenez also works as a coordinator of Rela Relays Research, Latin American Repository of Educational Calls, and holds the master's degree in bis on business and, least and a licentiate degree on English teaching from UNED. Let us give a warm virtual applause to Master Cindy Jimenez Pical. Thank you very much. It's really nice to, to be here. Um, I would like to start, well, thanking the organization of the event for providing these kind of spaces. For us teachers, it is very important to share in these kind of spaces to stay up to date with new trends and um, all the things that we can implement to make our teaching practice better. Okay, so um, I'm going to be sharing some information with you about what we do in the laboratory and also about some resources that we can use to make our lessons a bit more efficient and to assist us in our daily, um, in our daily activities. Let me start sharing my screen here. Okay. Are you looking at my screen now? Yes. Perfect, thank you. All right, so um, why can't I see the chat here? Okay, here we go. Um, well, I'm gonna talk to you basically about the resources for online assessment. But before that, I'm gonna give you a little bit of context about what I do. As Romy mentioned, I'm a researcher at UNED and I've also been a professor for about 15 years now. I've taught in, in different universities. Um, I've also worked as an advisor and I've always felt this passion for the use of technology in the education field. In the laboratory where I work, that is LEAT, the Technological Research and Innovation Laboratory of UNED, we always use or we always look for different ways of using technology towards innovation. Um, innovation comes from brainstorming. We usually have a question or a problem. Then we have a research process. Uh, we've all as teachers been also educated in how to do some research. And uh, we come to a point where we find different means to use technology for uh, to implement a process or to create something new. And that is basically the innovation. In the laboratory, we work on different fields. We are a multidisciplinary team. We work on computer science, such as, um, well, algorithms, the use of big data. We also work on environmental science, especially the, um, uh, the area of ecoacoustics, remote sensing, geographic information systems. And then we go to the area of the social sciences, where we have two main areas of research. That is the scientific communication and educational innovation. And that is where I take place. Um, I would like to start now this specific uh, part by looking at this image. Technology is a teaching aid. We have always heard about this and now in the context of a pandemic since a year and a half ago, we had to virtualize all the educational processes and many teachers were not prepared to do this. Many professors suffered when they knew that they had to start using um, 
a digital platform, uh, Microsoft Teams, or Moodle, Blackboard, that they had to use um, conferencing systems such as Zoom or WebEx because perhaps these professors and teachers were not very well trained in that area. Let's remember that as teachers, we have many different roles. And among those roles, we have, well, the main ones. We are facilitators, of course. We are not here to show students what to do. We are here to facilitate them learning how to do it well. We are assessors. We are role models, absolutely, on the job and outside as well. We are planners. We are information providers and we are resource developers. What does this mean? That we need to know how to create resources for our students. Now, uh, in the traditional schooling system, creating resources means taking copies from a text or maybe uh, just printing out some worksheets and handing, handing them out to our students in regular classes. Now, in a virtual environment, we cannot do that. If, that, if those strategies were already outdated before the pandemic, now we know that they are absolutely obsolete because we need to be able to modify our own teaching strategies to the students' contexts. Now, as teachers, we are trained to identify a problem, to look for different solutions, and to come up with ideas to solve it, right? I want to know um, from the people that are connected now, I would like you to tell me in the chat, what do you do when you need to create a resource. Oh, there is a typo there. Ready. What do you do when you need to create a resource and you don't know how? For example, you want to create an animation for your virtual class and you don't know how to do it. What is the first thing that you do? Please tell me in the chat. All right, the first response is Google it. Videos from YouTube, exactly. Ask another teacher, excellent. Tutorials, coworkers, perfect. Pinterest, excellent. That is an excellent resource as well. And teachers use it a lot. Okay, so we can either ask someone else or or we can also Google it. And that is like the most, um, the most popular solution for this. What happens if we Google how to make an animation? We're going to get thousands of results and we're going to get a lot of different pages that maybe we're going to start looking at them and checking up their features and they might sound interesting. And then we spend like 20, 30 minutes checking one of them and we come up to the page where it says that we have to pay even to, um, to create just one resource. Or maybe the resource by itself is not very user friendly and actually, well, as teachers with all the roles that we have, we need tools that are user friendly. We need tools that are easy to use, easy to understand, and that don't require us as educators to have technological background to be engineers or software developers. If we have those skills, great. If we can certify ourselves in the use of different technologies, excellent. However, we need to think of our average teachers. We need to be able to find tutorials. We need to be able exactly as Wendy says to adapt the content. But what we also need is to filter the information we receive because I'm sure that um, many of you don't have lots of free time to spend reviewing a lot of resources that Google suggests and that end up not being useful for us. Based on that uh, problem that was identified, 
a few years ago in one of our research projects, we started studying how are our teachers being trained on the use of technology in the classroom. There was a research study done in uh, some of the careers offered at UNED and other universities of Costa Rica, and we discovered that most of the English teaching programs had like one between one and three courses only between the more than 80 courses that our students were receiving only from one to three about using technology in the classes. So we've been educating our teachers very poorly in some of the cases on how to use technological resources. So we send them out to just Google it, to just use YouTube, and we need to find a way to make it easier for them to find the correct resources. So um, based on that problem that was identified, we developed at the laboratory, the class toolkit. The class toolkit is a directory of different resources that have completed or that fill out certain criteria. For example, and the most important ones, they are easy to use. They are extremely user friendly. You don't need any programming experience or formal, strict technological background to understand how to use them. Also, that they are open free at, or at least that they have um, a decent trial version that is for free because many times we get a three day trial version and what resources can we create in three days? I mean, we, we need something else. We need to, to get easier tools. Um, so here I'm gonna move to the class toolkit so I can show it to you and let me open up this. Okay, so we developed the class toolkit. Here, when I want to make um, a parenthesis, as I told you before, our job in the laboratory is not just to create nice uh, web apps. No, we always use a research process in the in in the means of getting to an innovation. So this specific class toolkit was the graduation project of a student that came to us looking for advice and for support on um, towards his degree, his licentiate degree on software developing. So this website was created, this web app, I'm sorry, was created based on the results of the research that showed uh, the main areas where our fellow student teachers were needing most of the help with. And also, uh, this was part of a project. It wasn't developed directly with us, but with one of the students that um, used this as a graduation project. So if we go to the toolkit, you're going to find, you don't need to log in or pay or anything. This is entirely open and it is in the main research website for the university. You can select from a wide menu of options. So what are you going to create? Here we have a lot of resources. All of these resources have been curated by us, by us personally, the, the laboratory staff. We don't want to just recommend something because it looks nice and then copy paste the features or the sales pitch from the The link is this one. Actually, I'm going to put it here in the chat. We don't want to just transmit the sales pitch from the developers of the tools. We want to tell you why us at the laboratory, why me as a teacher, why I think this is an important tool that you might find useful. So all of these uh, applications or these programs have been tested by us, have been used, we find their pros and cons, and uh, we, are, we are giving you our specific recommendation. So let's go here, for example, 
to infographics. So here we have these three um, apps that we recommend. And for each one, we are going to include, well, the tag or the qualification, the category, the link to the home site, and the features that we consider important. Because if you go to the picture chart website, you're going to find a long list of features and benefits and everything, but most of them are just generic or don't represent that much of a benefit for us. So these are the three more important things or aspects that we found about this category. And we also include a tutorial. All these tutorials are, well, from YouTube. They were not developed by us. However, of course, as the rest of the content, they have been curated and they have been carefully selected because uh, such as Googling for resources, Googling for tutorials can demand a lot of time as well because we can find really useful tutorials and others that just don't give us what we need. Um, let's look at another category. We have, for example, to create animations. So these are the ones that we recommend. Personally, I, I really love Powtoon. It is really, really easy to use. Um, when we develop the toolkit, actually the categories were up to here. We only had videos, poster, images, presentations, mind maps, infographics, animations, and video quizzes. Then we added games at the very end of the, um, uh, of the development. And we included also uh, the platforms that we, the other platforms that we developed at the laboratory, that is uh, Bioso News, the one that works with bioacoustics. And um, here, well, here appears to be a broken link because here we should have Geovision, that is one of the geographical systems. Then when we came to, um, to the context of the pandemic, we had a direct request from the Department of Telecommuting or of Work from Home in the university. And they asked us to support the community and include a lot more categories that were also useful, not only for teachers, but also for the employees of the university, of the faculty staff that needed to be creating resources for their own presentations. And we also found out that these resources were not just meant to be for teachers, but also for our students. We can apply this, um, these features, these programs, sorry, to developing any kind of resources for a formal presentation in our offices or for giving a class to pre-K students or to university students. That depends entirely on us. What we wanted to do with this tool was to make it easier to find the resources because any resource that you find here, uh, we can assure you that they have the criteria that I mentioned before, they are very, very easy to use, no programming experience required. That is one of the um, of the most common complaints from teachers. And also that they are free. I saw a question here about Powtoon. Powtoon has the two options. Powtoon um, has some features that are free. With the free features, you can create great, uh, great resources. Um, honestly, I use only the, the free options as well. So um, with Powtoon, you, you can create nice animations, great videos, and only using the, uh, the free options. Of course, if you want to pay for the premium options, most of these uh, programs or apps offer the premium options as well, and they give you more storage or more editing features, etc. Um, okay, and let's go to video quiz. That is the, um, the topic that we're going to continue with. We're going to come back to the toolkit in just a moment. I strongly encourage you to use it. And it's very important to, for us to get your feedback as well on the toolkit. Um, 
all these these apps the content of the toolkit is not just that i started i started googling how to make animations and then found those apps these are also recommendations from teachers so many teachers tell us hey i found this app and we study it we we check if it meets our criteria and then we post it here so if you guys have any apps or programs that want um that you want us to include here and that you think that comply with those requirements that uh, we can all use then just let us know you can send us an email and um, we will review the information so we can post it up here remember that the idea of um, of these kind of events is to strengthen our sense of community and in these times where we had to virtualize all the processes and um, we saw many many technology gaps in our fellow teachers, it has been really nice. I, I find it honestly very comforting to see how many teachers were bonding and how we actually got to help each other to, to complete our tasks, to get our students through this process and to um, actually shorten the learning curve of those teachers that maybe had almost to no experience using technology in their classes and now they are actually using the platforms they can uh, give their classes through zoom or webex or teams and um, we have actually assisted them in shortening this gap in um, making the learning curve go easier and smoother and it's really nice to know that we still uh, in the entire educational system, not only in Costa Rica, but in, in Latin America as well, um, well, and, and in, in a global level, that we have that sense of helping each other because as teachers, we all have the same means. We all have the objective of um, giving our students uh, the necessary tools for, uh, for completing their courses and uh, we all shared this same passion of helping each other. So um, that was like the emotional parenthesis. Um, we're gonna continue with this in a few moments. Let's go back to the presentation. Okay, now that we saw a little of the resources that we have available there in the toolkit, I want to reroute us to this. What do you think of when you look at this word? Assessment. What comes to your mind? Testing. Tests. Okay. Evaluations. Aspects to improve. Excellent. Exams. Evaluation. Some people say homework, grading, formative and summative, stress, exams, evaluations, quizzes. Um, what else? Uh, students learning outcomes, feedback, students' performance, mini projects. Exactly. Now, um, thank you. Actually, most of those terms also appear in this word cloud. When we think of assessment, we immediately think of tests because that's the way we have been trained. And how do we assess or evaluate our students in the traditional face-to-face -face environment? We hand out worksheets and then ask them to complete them or exams, but in the end they are worksheets just with a grade. Um, and we mark uh, with, a checks or with a check or with an X and then we give them a grade. Um, in the best case scenarios, we also have formative assessments in our classrooms where we give our students oral feedback, where we give them um, activities just to improve without giving them a, a grade, because we also know that there is a negative effect associated 
to this grading system because sometimes our students can feel that we are only looking at their mistakes. And if that happens, then they are not the ones that are failing. We are the ones that are failing. We need to be very careful with how we evaluate, with, with how we give feedback to our students. So on that um, concept, I want to clarify this, the difference between an assessment and an evaluation. The assessment is something that happens throughout the entire uh, education process. The assessment is always in a positive context. The assessment has to be individualized. This doesn't necessarily mean that um, we are going to have one-on-one -on -one sessions with our students. It means that even if we are looking at the work of our students or if we are assessing them in a group task, the feedback or even our notes are going to be individual. We cannot judge the performance of uh, one student based on the performance of the entire group or vice versa. We can't just take the performance of one student to judge the performance of an entire group. Um, and also in the assessment, we always have to provide feedback. We cannot just say this is wrong, this is incorrect, or this needs improvement. We have to provide the feedback on how to do it. Why? Because one of our other roles is as a facilitator, as an advisor. And an advisor doesn't only say, um, an advisor doesn't only say that this needs to be corrected. An advisor has to say how to correct it as well. And as facilitators, we should be able to tell them how to correct it, how to do it better. So we always need to provide feedback. Now, regarding feedback, we have a lot of different things to consider. We need to make sure that the feedback is always punctual, that it is concrete, um, that we use specific examples. For example, um, we cannot say just, you need to improve the use of grammar structures. We need to say, okay, specifically in this sentence, for example, you missed um, adding the S that we need when we use um, he, she, uh, simple present with he, she, it. Or in this specific word, uh, when you pronounced it, you need to emphasize the final sounds because it is in simple past and you need to make the difference between the pronunciation of the T or the D at the end. So when we give this feedback, we need to give specific examples of um, how the student can improve and in what moment specifically of the uh, production the student can improve as well. Now, when we go to the moment of the evaluation, the evaluation usually happens to provide closure to a specific process. That's why in our regular um, educational systems, we have the evaluation. Usually we have an entrance evaluation, a midterm evaluation, and a final evaluation. Um, the evaluation is judgmental in terms of not in the in the negative aspect necessarily, but we judge the work and we say if it meets a specific criteria or not. If it has what is necessary for the course that we're giving, if it gives us, if it is showing what we want to see or not, that's why it's um, categorized as judgmental. And also it is applied against standards. We use um, different kinds of rubrics that are standardized for all the students of that certain level or um, and even throughout different institutions. It shows shortfalls and this is what I was mentioning before. It is very important for us to be careful on how we use the evaluation because uh, there is a certain, um, certain tendency to give the evaluation in a negative context. And for our students, and even now in this virtual context, it is very important not to receive this kind of negative feedback all the time because they are under a lot of pressure. We are all under a lot of pressure. And if we as feedback only receive uh, 
notes on what we did wrong or all the mistakes we made, then that is not going to help us improve. We need to help our students. We need to give them the tools to improve, not just to know what they did wrong. Um, why do they share that we both require, they both require criteria because we cannot just um, check if what the student is saying sounds nice or not. We need to use a rubric to make sure that when we assess our students or when we evaluate our students, we don't forget or we don't miss any specific point that we had to check if they were complying with. Um, Indeed, Hilda, thank you. Students could even be scared of asking questions. Absolutely. That happens a lot. Many times our students don't ask questions because they freak out. They're afraid of, well, first, having the other students making fun of them, maybe, um, or just being put on the spotlight and um, not receiving a good response from our teachers. So that happens a lot in the evaluation. I'm sure you've all, you've all been familiar with um, situations where maybe a student gets 100 or gets an A plus and starts uh, showing it off to the rest of the classmates. What happens to the student that maybe got a, a, a 70 or even a lower grade? They're going to feel bad. They're going to, um, to put away their exam and uh, just feel the failure that um, that is around that grade. So as teachers, we need to improve how to, uh, how to make our comments on shortfalls sound as opportunities for improvement. It's our job to show them how the errors, how the mistakes are opportunities for improvement, not failures. Um, so the, the criteria and the measures are going to help us in those means. And both are evidence driven. This means that we are going to require observation of either the students development in classes or their production, either written production or speaking. But we are always going to have evidence that supports our um, our assessment or our evaluation. Um, I want to, yes, I want to, uh, I want you to look at the comment from Juan Pablo. Assessment should be about building trust and confidence in students from their aspects to improve. Absolutely. Because again, let's go back to our basic roles. We are not just teaching English. We are the facilitators of our students, not only in the, in the English subjects, but in general, we are teaching them for life, not just to pass our course, not just to get a good grade in the exams. So we need to make sure that we are treating them as complete persons, not just as one more name in our registries. Um, now, when we talk in terms of assessment or evaluation also, we can think of um, formal instruments, to call it like that. And that is when we go to questionnaires, um, to Google Forms, for example, that is the, the virtualization of the traditional exams where we have a set of questions and we need the students to select the correct answer or to complete the sentences with a specific, uh, following a specific instructions um, or um, producing sentences or paragraphs. And we also have this other kind of assessment or evaluation where we can use different projects for the students to apply what they have been learning. So, um, it's important here to remember that we are not teaching our students. Okay, let me rephrase that. When we, for example, explain grammar, um, we don't need our students, unless they are uh, English teaching students, to know specifically what is the, the 
I don't know, the, the syntax string of a specific sentence or to tell me specifically why um, the pronunciation of shape of the word shape has to sound like an A and why the letter A in a different word sounds as like an A. No, we don't want them to memorize rules on grammar, on syntax, on pronunciation and all the exceptions to all of these rules. We want them to know how to use them, how to actually use the language, how to produce both verbally and in writing using the language in the appropriate way. Because as Spanish native speakers, many of us I'm sure don't know by memory all the grammar rules specifically that we even studied in our first school years. When we teach the English language, we are teaching the language for them, for the students to be able to use it properly. Unless, again, we are preparing English professionals that actually require that information. But okay, um, when we do that, we need to make sure that uh, we offer a variety of methodologies on how to assess or evaluate that performance. And that is when we can also go to projects. And I actually think that there was a mention to that by Jorge, I prefer students create something they like it following the topics we studied exactly. And that's exactly what I'm referring to. Um, when we use projects, when we ask our students to produce something, we can actually evaluate the same criteria or the same grammar structures as if we were asking them in a form or in a test. What is the difference? That the student is actually producing something else. The student is feeling useful. The student is um, adding passion to, to what is being produced at that moment and that is going to minimize the opportunity of mistakes happening when our students feel that they can relate to what they are studying it's going to become easier we're going to have significant learning and uh, we are going to definitely improve their performance if we only uh, ask our students to complete the exams, then the students are going to see the structures, the grammar structures, for example, just in the terms of completing the exam. I'm going to study just to pass a test. And the idea is not just to pass a test, is to actually learn the language, to become proficient in the language. So um, indeed, using projects or e -E and using letting the students produce in a topic where they feel comfortable is going to help us also because it's going to make it easier to actually see how they perform in the language. We can use the same criteria, we can maintain our quality standards as professors, we can still uh, totally respect the program that we need to comply with in the institution wherever we work, but we can make it more familiar for the students. We can make it nicer for them. In, the, in that case, when we make it nicer for them also, it's going to um, minimize this effect of uh, being afraid of the spotlight and not wanting to share in the language because I'm going to make mistakes and people are going to laugh at me or because I just don't feel confident enough. Um, Exactly, rules are for teachers, students just need how to use them. I always tell my students, I also work uh, as a professor in the language center, in UNED's language center, and I always tell my students, um, I'm not training you to be English teachers. I'm, I'm trying to, to help you understand how, to, how the language works. And I don't want you to memorize the rules, I just want you to know that's the way it happens. How do we do that? not by memorizing grammar rules, but by practicing and practicing and practicing until the grammar rules are internalized and they become automatic. Um, let's see what Maria says. It has happened to me that when evaluating my students by projects, I always end up modifying the rubric criteria. Yes, it happens a lot, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. Because remember that, um, well, 
one of the most um, of, of the most positive parts of the projects um, is that we can actually make these kind of changes. We can adapt the projects or the requirements based on each situation. Because when we give out a project, the project is not a, a closed question. The project doesn't have, um, we might have an expected outcome, but we don't have like a template uh, of exactly what the student is going to produce. So if the student gives us something that maybe we were not expecting, there's nothing wrong with changing our criteria if we still comply with what we were looking for. So for example, um, I wanted my students to talk about their abilities using the structure of questions with can. And I wanted them cr to create a dialogue um, asking, can you swim or can you play guitar? And they ended up also talking about um, why guitar, the guitar is not their favorite instrument, but that they can also play the piano. So even though maybe they deviated a little from the topic, they are still giving me what I need to make sure they comprehend. I can still measure what I need to measure and say, okay, yes, they dominate that structure and extra points for being fluent. I really love the, the confidence and how they carry out the, um, the development of the task. So when we get this kind of projects, we can adapt ourselves and our expectations to um, make sure that what they produce is appreciated as well. Remember that students don't need to adapt to us. As teachers, we need to adapt to our students. Um, it would be great also to say that the educational system has to adapt to the students. I, again, I think that is the way it should be, but that takes a lot of time. So what can we actually do as individuals, as professors, uh, we can adapt ourselves, we can adapt our strategies to make sure that um, we are providing a confident concept, context for our students to produce. And if that means changing my rubric, or if that means just uh, adjusting my expectation to what the student is producing, then it's part of our job, it's part of our role as well. Um, Let's see, get to know our students' likes and dislikes. Yes, that is basic also. This is something tricky, guys, because when, when, we, were, when we are in face-to-face -face classes, um, we can actually look at their faces. And when we are explaining something, we can just be monitoring if, well, first of all, if they're paying attention or if they're just on their phones or doing something else. And we can also start looking at their faces to see if they are understanding what we are explaining or if they are just making these kind of faces of what? I have no idea what you're talking about. So we know that maybe that student is not going to ask directly or um, is not going to raise the hand, but we know that we need to change the way we are explaining because someone is not understanding. When we are in a virtual environment, usually we don't have that. Because, for example, look at this space. Because of connectivity issues and more, we can't have all the cameras um, open. So I cannot look at you. You cannot look at me. But I have no idea if you, well, um, if you are making faces or if you laugh or if you maybe, um, well, if your facial expressions show um, disgust or confusion or any other emotion. So that part of the feedback that we used to receive when we were teaching has been removed. How do we get feedback? We have to use channels such as this one. Even if it's uh, by the means of a chat, we can have a, a somehow normal conversation as maybe we could do it if we were just um, in a teacher's lounge having a coffee. The important part here is that we need to modify our expectations. We need to modify our strategies. And again, it's our job as teachers 
to make those modifications. It is not our students or our audiences. Let's not only talk about students. Uh, it's not the job of the audience to adjust to us. It is the other way around because we are the professional ones. And we are the ones when we're explaining something either in a class or in a space like this one, it's because we think that we have something useful for other people, that we have something valuable that can help others um, simplify a specific process. And uh, therefore we need to adjust ourselves. If since the very beginning that I asked you the first question, I think it was about uh, what you did. Yeah, what you did when you needed to find um, a resource or, or how to create a resource and you didn't know how to do it. If at that moment uh, I hadn't received any response, um, I, I had only received or maybe just one or two, I would have immediately thought, OK, then maybe this is not going to work. Uh, I, I can't just resort to ask questions because they're not going to reply to me in the chat. Um, but well, thankfully, it worked. The, the thing here is that we as teachers need to be able to adapt. And that adaptation cannot depend on time. We need to be able to adapt quickly. Um, that's exactly what happened with our teachers a year and a half ago when we had to virtualize the processes. Many teachers, well, all of the teachers that needed this training and that needed to start feeling more comfortable with technology didn't have a year and a half or five years of university education and exploration and research to get used to using technological tools. They had to do it immediately. They had like this time frame of two weeks or uh, I think it was like four weeks when classes were completely canceled and then we went back to um, to the contingency plans. So the learning curve had to be shortened because there was no time for um, for taking time to learn. So as a teachers, we have to adapt. And we have to adapt with whatever time frame we are given to do so, whether it's one minute, one week, one month, or one year. It's just part of the adventure. Fortunately, most of us teachers also are passionate for this. So we do it. It's it's part, it's just the point of it. Um, when I finish an online class, I change the scenario with a park. My students love it. That sounds really nice. That sounds really nice. Remember that uh, we specifically in this context, we need to try and um, make it as familiar as possible. We don't want the coldness of the technology to infect our classrooms or to, in, to infect our sessions. Technology by itself can be just uh, cold, can be um, just using tools, using computers and solving forms. But as teachers, we need to make it familiar for the students. We need to make it dynamic and we need to make it also something that they, um, that they actually enjoy. Um, the class tool, is it only for students and teachers at Edonet? Absolutely not. It is open. Um, let me go back here. Um, that's the link. It's also here somewhere in the chat. Let's put it back here. It's open. You can use it at any time. You don't need to log in or create any account or anything. You can just use it. OK, so. Going back to the part of projects, assessments, and evaluations, I'm going to recommend you specifically two, um, uh, two of the tools because we could be speaking here for forever. Um, Edpuzzle is one of the, of the apps that I love the most. This one is really, really useful. You can create your own videos. Okay, you can create your own videos or you can use videos from their library. Their library is not just some random library connected to YouTube. It's um, connected to educational platforms such as Khan Academy, Nat Geo, TED Talks. So you can use their videos. And what's the magic in it puzzle? That you can edit the videos and embed a quiz. Oh, thank you. And embed a quiz in the video. So. Um, 
we might have an, a video that lasts 10 minutes. There is no way our students, regardless of their age or level, are going to pay attention to the full video for 11 minutes. So what we can do with Edpuzzle is embed questions at certain moments of the video. Let's say at minute three, we can just stop the video and a question pops up that says, okay, what was the main idea or what was this character doing? Select the, from the different options. That way, in that way, we know that first our students are paying attention. We keep it, we keep the interaction going. It's not something just static. Um, so we also make it, it's like a hook to keep our students uh, paying attention to the video that is what we need, that we need them to receive the entire content and make sure that they are rescuing the important parts. Um, to add transcript to a video, I think it puzzle has that option as well. We have different other video editors. Most of the video editors offer those options as well. I recommend looking at the ones we suggest in the toolkit. See, commercial there. Okay, um, the other tool that I wanted to suggest and um, most of you must be familiar to it is Kahoot. Kahoot, um, it's very useful for games. That is uh, one of the, of the main uses. However, we can also use it as an assessment. Why? Because from the admin site, we can look at the stats. We can look at the responses from the students. Um, in Kahoot, we create a quiz. The quiz shows a question here and offers different options here. So the students from their devices can select the option that appears here, 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 or here. So we are going to get um, in the means, in the context of a game or a competition, because the students will be getting the scores and who has the, the highest score, who goes first, who goes second, who is moving in the, um, in the position table. Um, Kahoot is also going to give us the stats to know, for example, in which question that we made, we got the most um, the we got the most incorrect answers, or where in which one did the students take more time to answer? So maybe taking that much time to answer represents that that is a topic where they are struggling. Um, Kahoot can be just used as a, well as a game to take our students out of the routine and do something quick and simple um, and fun for them. Or we can also use it as a game that also gives us um, inputs for our assessment. Um, these tools, again, can be found here in the toolkit. We have a lot of categories. Uh, we've also included that something important based on the uh, experience and what we have been seeing in this virtual change, um, our students and specifically children, when we talk about um, preschool, primary school, and even some high school students, we have found it very useful to include information on parental control. This maybe is not specifically about um, assessment and the role um, of the evaluations in the education process, but as teachers, we also need to make sure that the devices, the, the technological environment of our students is safe for them. And safe also means that they are not getting spam, they are not getting porn, they are not getting any kind of appropriate of inappropriate content in their devices. Um, same thing as if we were in regular classrooms and we just kept our children inside the class, making sure no strange people approach them. This is, um, this is why we included the category of parental control and we have uh, recommended here we recommend some uh, apps that also are free that they are easy to use that we can recommend even to our uh, fellow colleagues as parents or to our students parents as well. 
now that we are using their devices as means for our lessons, for our sessions, it is also our responsibility to offer these kind of advices on how to make it a safe environment for them. Um, okay, we also have uh, programming applications. This is great, guys. For example, Scratch or the MIT App Inventor, these two are my favorites. These are programs that um, our students can use to start acquiring basics on programming without knowing it, just by playing. I don't know if you remember, um, well, at least my generation, and uh, I think that around 10 to 15 years uh, up or down, we used Logo. This program um, that was a little turtle in the computers and we asked the turtle to walk up or down or left or right. That was just programming basics. And we thought it was a game. Micromundos, yes. Now, these are apps that um, try to teach uh, students of any age, not necessarily kids, how to use programming, um, how to program without giving them a, a code or the, the complicated part of programming. These are very user friendly. I strongly recommend that if you have any, even any idle time in your classes and you, you want to give them something useful to do uh, on that idle time, uh, I strongly recommend this. Because again, if as teachers we didn't receive any uh, technological, any technology um, formal education, we need to make sure our students are getting that. We need to make sure our students get more familiar with uh, with the technology and they, they are, that they can actually modify it towards their needs. So this is very useful. Um, we also have some tools for telecommuting. Um, well, we these are like the most popular Skype, Zoom, uh, Google Meet, WhatsApp, but there are others that can help us here. We also have remote connection, productivity apps to measure our productivity. For sound cancellation, calculators, websites, how to create websites. This is a very fun project for students and we can evaluate a lot of things if we ask them to create websites and again, entirely free surveys. And we also have anti-plagiarism platforms because we also have to check that. I mean, being teachers is not just uh, being fun. We need to make sure that quality is always um, one of the most important criteria and honesty and everything. And even though we trust our students and we know that they are all nice people, uh, we need to keep this handy as well. There are many others that, um, uh, that are available. For example, UNED by itself has this one in the platforms and I forgot the name. Um, Turnitin. Yes, Turnitin. Turnitin. Thank you. Thank you. That's the one that we use at ONET. However, that requires a license. So these ones are um, either free or they have at least a free trial version that has a decent time frame for us to actually use it. So as you can see in the toolkit, we have a lot of recommendations that I strongly hope you find useful. Again, communication is very, very important for us. Um, are the recommendations included about the age of students? How old the students need to be? Okay, um, the resources by themselves don't have an age limitation. However, you can go, for example, to Kahoot or to Wordwall, uh, to any of these resources, and most of them offer the 
uh, forums or the community. In those forums, the professors or the different developers of the resources share their own resources. Let me show you something. Let's change here. Let's go to Wordwell. Okay, look at this. This is another resource, Wordwell. It is not in the toolkit because I found it this week and I honestly love it. So this is Wordwell. This is um, a page that helps me create matchups, quizzes, random wheels, missing words, a lot of different activities. I can create my own activities or I can resort to what other fellow teachers have shared here. And in that case, then I can see if there is any, any age limitation. For example, here, if I go to community, I can look for how to use, um, I don't know, let's say I'm studying present perfect. So here I have different resources that have been created by other teachers that are ready to use. And those very, very nice teachers have made their resources available for the public so that we can reuse them as well. Um, let's look, for example, at this one. This is a resource that is ready to use. We have a lot of questions and based on the context, on the contents here, we can decide if uh, it applies to our students or if it is maybe a bit too high on the level or if the questions are not going to be appealing because our students are, I don't know, uh, first graders or second graders and they can they might not find them interesting. So in some cases, yes, roulettes are really fun with, it, with them. In some cases, you can find the age um, specification in the description of the resources, but it's just mostly about checking them up. Um, again, I just found Wordwell this week and I love it. So shortly, it's going to be also a recommended site in the toolkit. Um, like this, also in Netpuzzle or in Kahoot or in Socrative, in any other, in, in many other um, websites that we recommend, in many other resources, you can find this community section where the resources that you create can be of your private use or they can be shared with others. And then again, what we were talking about uh, at the very beginning of, the, of MySpace, um, this is about having keeping this sense of community among teachers. So this is how we help out each other. Many times, uh, maybe we are rushing, uh, preparing a class and we don't have all the activities. And this is something, I mean, a total lifesaver. Um, okay, let's see. I saw another recommendation here. Jitsi, thank you, Tatiana. I'm going to uh, keep that here in mind so that we can check it and include it in the toolkit. Let's see what else we have here. A book that you can recommend about technology. Hmm. You know, that is a, uh, that is a very, that is a tricky question because there, no, to, to answer your question directly, no. I can, I don't have a book that I recommend about technology. What I recommend is just start practicing, start looking for things, start your trial and error, um, looking for what you feel more comfortable with. But um, as for the, 
a, a book about technology itself. No, I think it's something very wide and um, the best practice here or my best, my advice would be to start joining maybe um, social uh, communities in social networks, groups like Facebook groups or um, even the Twitter trends or Pinterest groups, Pinterest walls, where you can actually start getting more resources and tips and news regarding trends and changes that can actually impact your uh, teaching practice. Let's see what else we have here. Even though the pandemic situation has not been ideal for most education educators many resources were created that helped to carry out the task absolutely we knew that technology was uh, an aid in the education uh, process that it was something we could use to make our classes more interesting and then the pandemic happened and technology was no longer an option was no longer a plus in our lessons it was the basic um, the basic component of our classes. So um, yes, there are many Facebook groups. Um, for example, I am in a lot of um, design thinking groups where uh, they share tips on how to help students um, make mind maps or draw out their projects instead of, for example, instead of writing an essay, making a, a diagram with uh, pictures and arrows and keywords and stuff. So yes, you, you can find groups in, in social networks such as Facebook that um, give you tips on how to, how to use technology here. Excellent English teachers in Costa Rica. I think I'm in both of them as well. Any tool about online grading? Mm, I'm not sure I understand what tool you mean. Like for keeping a, a grade book? I think we don't have any tool for that, but I can uh, put it in my to-do list, and we can find um, we can find tools for that to be added in the class toolkit. For mind maps, for mind maps, we have. Uh, I really like CMAP tools. However, that one is like very formal, um, very structured. We have many others like in this case FreeMind, which has an unavailable video that's also important we need we try to keep our videos updated however sometimes this happens i'm terribly sorry um CISO has an option for keeping students great okay that's very important many of these uh features of these websites offer internal grading for the activities that they do inside the platform that happens with edpuzzle and let's see i also remember uh, there was another one no okay the thing is that when we have I think it was with play posit as well that um, we can see we can receive the records of the students um, regarding all the activities that they have done inside the platform because in our teaching profile we can uh, create our groups so when the students log in and do the activities we see the reports we see the stats their scores and everything so we can keep track of that however like um what I what we don't have yet, and I, I thought that was your question, is a tool to keep the grading like we do it in an Excel spreadsheet that we we have all the formulas and we just include um, the points obtained and we get the score and the, the percentages, etc. So um, I'm going to look for um, for those options to see if we have enough resources that comply with our criteria and we can add them to the toolkit. OK, um, with Kahoot and quizzes, we have the report, the reports feature. Excellent. And even with Word, well, we have the reports feature. 
but it's only available for some of them. For a roulette, it's not available. But for example, I just had an activity last week, no, this week, where students needed to order a story. So I could actually get the results from this from the students that were doing it. I could see them at the moment here in my results. And I could see their performance. Um, I could see the general information about the group and also the results by student. So, um, well, all of them had to have uh, all the correct answers to complete the task, but I had also how long it took them, each of the teams to complete the task. So we can see that we have the tracking inside the resources um, that is available in most of these kind of activities. Okay, uh, we are getting uh, short of time. So what I wanted to do was just tell you what we do in the lab, offer you the class toolkit, which is, which is really, really useful. And again, it's not just um, for you to have it, but also it's very important for us to have your input on keeping it updated, on keeping, uh, on including more resources. Um, because uh, again, as a community, we have to help each other. So we offer this uh, this web app, the toolkit, but we need you to help us uh, keep it as populated as possible and update it as possible as well. I want to finish my presentation by showing you. Ah, by showing you this technology will not replace great teachers but technology in the hands of great teachers can be transformational this was well this is a quote from george kouros i don't know if you know him he is an innovative innovative teaching learning and leadership consultant he is a great speaker i'm like one of his biggest fans uh, and yeah i i like stalk him <laughs> on social media because he is great so i think this is this summarizes what i wanted to share with you uh thank you very much for the space thank you very much for joining the the um, uh, my talk and for sharing in such a great way in the chat it's been really nice also i'm gonna leave here my email in case you want to contact me directly um, either about the resources in the class toolkit or if you have a research project that you think we could help you uh, developing it in the laboratory we'll be more than glad to assist you so again it's been my pleasure thank you very very much and i hope to see you in other events Thank you. Following, Master Tobias Vizela, representative from the organizing committee, will share the questions or comments that were posted by the participants in the chat. Thank you, Cindy. That was an awesome presentation. You were, I mean, presenting many, many tools, resources, and we are so thrilled to see all the possibilities that we have. I think you were almost 100% able to cover and to answer, to respond to all the comments. People are so excited about the presentation. They were saying this has been so useful, the information, the tools, but I think you, so far you've been able to, I mean, respond to everything. I think there was only one question that maybe you missed. It was at the very beginning. It was Francois, I think that's his name. And he asked, Cindy, what's your favorite web app? Ah, yeah, sorry, I missed that one. And that is such a tough question. Well, I have to say that my favorite is the class toolkit. But besides that one, um, right now it's Wonderwall, the one I just showed you, because it just, it blew my mind this week. I can't choose one. I mean, 
we have so many resources that are great uh, but right now well class toolkit is my baby it uh, emerged from uh, a problem that I identified when I was a, a student in the licentiate process, and it's it's my baby. I love it, so that's why I feel passionate for it. And this week, my favorite web app is uh, well, my favorite resource is Wonderwall. I have to say that. Great. There was another comment uh, by Francini, and I think it was related to what you were talking about keeping track of results. And she said, it, it would be great to use something to simplify the process of filling up rubrics. I usually print them, evaluate the projects and then I send pictures to my students' parents, but that takes a lot of time. Yes, indeed. Um, we don't have that category in the toolkit yet. I do use RubyStar. Uh, that's another free resource that we have available, but... Um, I, I can't think of any other. Um, I usually just stick to, to Excel templates. Uh, and I, when I don't have the, the platform to, for the students to check the grades online uh, immediately, I use just to, um, to fill out Excel templates and then a screenshot and send it to the students uh, through WhatsApp. However, there has to be something to help us in that. I'm going to take note of that as well and uh, see if we can come up with a solution and include it in the class toolkit. Well, again, Cindy, many of the comments saying amazing presentation. So happy for all the tools, um, all the resources that you were presenting. I think we can finish inviting them again to go check out, right? They took the, the, I mean, all the resources, and maybe you can paste again the link in the chat so that we can all go and check all those wonderful resources. Thank you, Cindy, for your wonderful presentation. Thank you very much for the space and for, uh, well, for participating this much in uh, the activity. Again, um, it's always our pleasure to share.